Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. As we move into the new year, I am thinking about people who have moved from one part of their lives to another, who have needed to say goodbye to their old life or their relationships, and have needed to somehow emerge into the world again or into the world for the first time and into a safer place, a safer environment with healthier people. And I would love to know how you do it and how you did it and what helped along the way. It's so important for the listeners to be able to learn from you. So as the new year begins, I'll be doing another call-in show. And this one with the theme of new beginnings. So if you'd like to have a question that you'd like me to answer on the show, or if you'd like to kind of give a brief synopsis about what helped you end the old part of your life and start anew, and what challenges you had, and even also what was not helpful, what was not good to do on your way, that's educational as well. Please leave a message at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com if you want to leave a written message, and you can let me know if you'd like me to use your name or not. Or you can leave a voicemail message on my office line at 818-907-0036. If it cuts you off, then just call back and continue your message. And let me know also if you want me to use your name or not. Please do so within the next few weeks so I can put together the call-in show as we begin the new year. Thank you so much. Rabbi Eddie Feinstein is the senior rabbi of Valley Beshalom Synagogue in Encino, California. He lectures widely across the United States. He is the author of several books, and most recently, he received his doctorate in education from the Jewish Theological Seminary, where he did his dissertation on Rabbi Harold Schulweis and the reinvention of the American rabbinate. In 1990, he assumed the position of executive director of Camp Ramah in California, the largest Jewish camp and conference center in the Western United States, where we actually met. He came to Valley Beth Shalom in 1993 at the invitation of the renowned Rabbi Harold Schulweis, my rabbi when I was growing up, and also a good friend of the family until his passing a few years ago. Eddie succeeded Rabbi Schulweis as the congregation's senior rabbi in 2005. Eddie's wife is also a rabbi, Rabbi Nina Bieber Feinstein. And she was the second woman ordained by the conservative movement in Judaism. It's always nice to talk to someone who is so bright, so caring, and a friend. And what Eddie is known for, among other things, is being a very engaging lecturer and storyteller. He infuses ancient Jewish love of ideas with the warmth of Jewish humor. We've had many conversations, but we've never talked about these particular issues. And so I'm so happy we had a chance to broach them today. I'm looking forward to having you hear our conversation. Here's Rabbi Feinstein now. So I am very happy today to have Rabbi Eddie Feinstein, who I know is Eddie, because I've known you for 40 some odd years or more. Right. Uh, from our summer camp and just community. I was really excited to be able to have you on to talk about leadership, the difference between sort of a healthy leader and a not healthy leader, someone who is a teacher versus someone who is sort of omnipotent, omniscient, can't be argued with and doesn't mind dictating other people's lives and sort of making them suffer for the cause, whatever the cause is, or sometimes the cause is just to fill their ego. But also I wanted to be able to get back to something that I talked about on the podcast before about walking through metal detectors uh, this year, going to high holiday services and the impact of that. 
So, um, Eddie, if you can just introduce yourself and then we'll go from there. My name is Ed Feinstein. I work as a rabbi in a very large synagogue in suburban Los Angeles called Valley Beth Shalom in the town of Encino, which is right in the middle of the beautiful San Fernando Valley. I grew up near here. My mom and dad owned a bakery, and I grew up in the back of the bakery shop. Um, did well in school, got to go to the University of California at Santa Cruz, where I had very long hair and strange ideas, uh, and then studied for the seminary, studied for the rabbinate for many years. Um, I worked in Texas. I've worked here in Los Angeles. I'm, I'm married. We have three kids, and all of them are married, and we're waiting for grandchildren. But in the meantime, we have an adorable grand dog. And I'm very happy to be with you, Rachel. I've admired your work for many, many years. You've been kind enough whenever I've sent uh, clients, patients to see you, you've given them deep and powerful wisdom. So this is a great honor to share a few minutes of conversation with you. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say and very generous of you to say. And I, I look up to you in that I, 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 like, I like your humanity that comes through and whenever we're talking, and I do remember the long hair, I didn't know about the strange ideas. Uh, but uh, <laughs> actually, I remember Red Bandana also. Red Bandana, yeah. And I learned to love the Grateful Dead. So. Uh huh. Right. Okay. It gives you some sense of my generational orientation. I'm a long line of Jewish fans of the Grateful Dead, and I, I was curious also to hear more about growing up in a bakery because I know that 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 makes its own impact for a lot of reasons. Um, but I think that it's it's good to hear that you've had so many different kinds of experiences. And I'm sure you've seen that there is a different expectation placed on leadership in different areas and what the congregation is expecting of their leader and what, what that's like here in Los Angeles. But going back to what you just mentioned about growing up in a bakery. So how did that form you in certain ways? My parents had an ethic of feeding people. Uh -huh. um, in every way possible. My mother created a community around this place. So if on a Sunday morning you came to buy a dozen bagels and a cheesecake, there was always a hundred people waiting there. But there was always a sense of connection. Learning how to connect people uh, is something that I learned from my parents. Um, learning how to nurture people was something that I learned from my parents. And uh, the work that I do in synagogue life and religious life is really an extension of what they taught me. And so it's an interesting thing. I, I wrote down the word connection. Also, of course, nurture is extremely important. But there are a lot of people who will talk about having gotten involved in an organization that, or a political movement or whatever it was, just so they had a sense of connection. And sometimes even the philosophy or uh, the theology mattered less than having a community. Uh, right. And then they came to realize that those connections were conditional connections. It was based on if you believe the same way. and um, and so, but still the power of connection and also the need for it that draws people into places and into communities, both healthy and not. And I'm sure you've seen both. Well, look, the, the, in, in the human sphere, um, all of our truths are dialectical. In, in mathematics, it's either A or not A, X or not X. But in the human sphere, it's always A and not A, X and not X. In this case, we have two impulses, and both of them are deeply important and deeply true. The one is the impulse to belong. All of us want to belong. We are born into families. We are nurtured if we're blessed by families. Sometimes we're nurtured by a family of families, which we call a community. And I think all human beings at some level want to belong. Look, just give you the craziest example. In prison, the worst punishment is solitary confinement. Now imagine that, people who are sociopaths, psychopaths, murderers, killers, and yet the worst thing you can do is to isolate them from the community of others. We all want to belong. That's one impulse. But there's a second impulse, which is the impulse to be true to myself, an impulse to be personally authentic, an impulse to grow and to become the person that in some way my soul needs me to become, I'm meant to become. Well, the, the issue that you're raising is what happens when a community that accepts me and offers me belonging denies my need to grow, denies my need to be authentic, suppresses my voice, suppresses my conscience, suppresses my dreams and aspirations. That's what you call an unhealthy, an unhealthy community. The ideal community allows me to become the person I'm meant to be. And the person I'm meant to be 
ideally it helps me strengthen the community that I belong. And it's that symbiosis that makes a family work. It's that symbiosis that makes a community work. And ultimately, it's that symbiosis that makes a that makes a world work. Unfortunately, there's many cases, as you said, where communities are oppressive, abusive, conditional, where they steal one sense of self. And, and that's where you that's where you run across the kind of unhealthy or I would call it in theological language. I would say that's evil. That's the destruction of the soul, which is the most precious thing we have in the world. That's that's where that's where evil lives. Mm. So the destruction of the soul and coming back from that, I mean, that that's sort of the wreckage that I deal with and that you deal with and people coming to you saying, I've been through something awful or I got derailed in my life and I yes. want to be able to come back. And so what helps them to come back? And I guess also, what do you provide? Because I know there are all these opportunities for connection at the synagogue and other places of worship, but what what do you think helps most when people are finding their way back? That's a, a wonderful question. And, and there's no simple formula, but let's begin with a few simple principles. The first thing that I do, and I'm sure it's the first thing you do, is simply to listen. Here is a safe place. Tell me your story. When, when people come for any purpose to my study, to my office, to, to sit with me, my first question is, tell me about yourself. Where are you from? How did you come to this? What is your journey? And I'm listening, and I want to listen. So the, the first rule of any religious leadership is listening. In fact, most people think that people like me, rabbis, pastors, ministers, priests, imams, uh, any religious leader is, is valued for their ability to talk. And God knows we talk a lot. But any one of us would tell you that the most powerful ability is the ability to listen. To listen for what's said and to listen for what isn't articulated, but is there in the person's heart. So the first thing is come and tell me your story. And I'm going to sit quietly and listen. And, and if you really want to know, and, and I, I would offer this as a principle because I teach this when I teach young rabbis. If you want to know right away whether a religious leader is legitimate, figure out who's talking more. If you go visit a religious leader and they talk more than you do, that's not legitimate leadership. But if a religious leadership comes and says, tell me about you, tell me about your journey. Tell me about what's in your heart, in yourself, in your soul. Tell me about your aspirations. Tell me your pain. Tell me what you've been through. And that person has the ability to sit and listen and absorb what you've said and ask searching questions. You might have in front of you a, a great leader, a person who is truly able to help you grow. So the first question is leadership, is, is listening. Sorry, the first question of leadership is listening. And then once I listen, I, I try to hear, as you do, what does this person truly need? And what does this person need from me? Sometimes all the person needed is a moment of listening. People have walked out of my office after an hour, and I realized I didn't say anything to them. And I wondered, did I help them at all? And they'll tell me later it was the best hour they had all week. It was, it's a safe place to talk. It's a safe place to express yourself. And there aren't a lot of places like that. First of all, it's a lonely society. Second of all, it's a society of people who have no time for each other. And third, it's a time when people don't share common languages. So if somebody says, tell me your pain, and they really care, that's a precious gift. So just the first thing is listening. And then beyond that, do they need some? Do they need, do they need a connection? Are they looking for friends? Are they looking for community? Do they need purpose? Are they people who are walking the world with all sorts of aspirations, but they want to attach themselves to something bigger than themselves? A movement, an ideal a value, a mission in the world. Everybody wants to feel like they're part of a great cause, that they're fighting for a cause. Well, if I can connect somebody with that. So if I send a family to the homeless shelter to serve a meal on a Sunday afternoon, if I send a young person to tutor a kid in reading uh, on a Monday afternoon, if I, if I send a, uh, a, a grandma to join a knitting circle that's creating baby blankets for kids in a inner city hospital and these people come back with a, the biggest smile on their face they served they they connected themselves to something bigger that's the second thing that i can offer after listening the third thing that i can offer is a circle of friends just to be together i mean sometimes just to have people around you for a meal uh, just to have people that share your life and are interested in who you are and what you are 
That's another thing that we can offer. And then sometimes people are looking for wisdom. They, they want to know the sources of ancient wisdom. They've, they've, they've run into that wonderful moment you get. I, I remember getting this moment when my kid was born and I realized I was 30 years old and had a child in the world that I was responsible for. And even though I had many, many college degrees up on the wall, I knew nothing. I needed wisdom older than myself. And not just knowledge, not just facts, not just information, but real wisdom about how do you live? Show me a roadmap for life. So these are all the things that people come and I can offer these things in certain ways. And, and sometimes I'm successful in connecting them with other people, with wisdom, with, um, with a, a sense of mission. That's what a religious institution like ours can do. Okay, I just took about four pages of notes while you were talking. Um, <laughs> so. Bad habit. Sorry. <laughs> No, that's that. That's not apology worthy. That's that. That is a lot of wisdom, and it's a lot of food for thought. And going back to the bakery idea, um, so that's actually an interesting idea. Uh, talking about you, drawing from your parents to you, that it's food for thought. Um, so, okay, a couple of things. First of all, uh, okay, starting with this idea of purpose. So one of the things that I deal with is when people come to me and they've had other people define their purpose. Right. And so then what do you do then? Because yes, people do want to know that they're here for a reason, whatever that reason is. But it, it, while you can provide people, I think with different kind of paths to take, there are people who come to me and say, I knew that my purpose was to serve this person. Mm -hmm. uh, or right, it was to give over everything to this belief or this political idea or whatever else. And I realized that was actually not mine. That was defined by someone else. And so it seems that it's important to give people exposure to different routes towards finding their purpose and also helping them see that there might not be just one. Right. Let's take that apart a moment. Um, as I said, it, you have to think of the dialectic between um, belonging and between uh, self-realization, mm -hmm. and they're both true. And, and so, so if you have a person who is saying to you, um, I've been serving this leader or serving this community or serving this cause, serving this mission, but inside of me is a terrible feeling that I'm being repressed. That's something authentic and powerful of me is being suppressed. And the leader tells me that's sin, that's Satan speaking to me. That's my own ego speaking to me. That's a rationalization. Well, I would hope, I would hope, I would pray that that person has enough self-possession, self-power to say, no, that's not Satan. That's the me. That's my soul screaming out to be protected. That's my soul screaming out to be rescued. And that's why, you know, a person like you, Rachel, is so critical to that person's growth because you're the one that could say, well, well, tell me about that self. Tell me about, let's hear that voice. Let's listen to that voice together. And let's see if that voice really is the voice of Satan, or if that voice is the voice of your own soul crying out because it's been crushed. It's being suppressed. And before it dies, it wants to live. It wants to be rescued. Um, that's the dynamic. Is this easy? As you well know, it's terribly difficult. It's, it requires a tremendous courage on the part of the individual coming for help. Yes. And it tre requires tremendous wisdom on the part of the counselor, you, um, or a rabbi or a priest or minister like me, who's gonna listen to it. But, but the first thing is, if, if the person says to you, if, 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 if the person says to me, here's my sense that my soul is being crushed, and I listen to them, tell me your story, that's an indication of something. That means I'm, I care more about you than about me. The, 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 the leader who is, in, who is there to be worshipped is going to tell you the truth. The leader who is there to elevate you is going to listen to your truth. That's one of the ways to tell the difference. One of the ways. Not the only, and it's certainly more subtle than that in practice, but that's one of the ways. The second thing is, again, d does the mission I'm serving, does the community I'm serving, does it elevate me? Do I feel like I'm growing? Or do I feel like I've been suppressed? And, and at that moment, you know, listen, it's, um, it's almost like, a, you can tell me, because from a therapeutic point of view, it's almost like an addiction. You know, the, the, the addict will always find a rationalization for taking the next drink or shooting the next drug. 
It takes tremendous power for an addict to say, it's time for me to get clean. Uh, because it's pushing back at a great deal of programming that's inside of that person. A person who's been involved in one of these groups and are involved in one of these circumstances, or involved in a relationship which is sucking them dry, it takes tremendous courage to come forward and say, I need something. I feel my soul crying out for help. And so you, you listen for that. On the other hand, look, I mean, you know, one of the greatest things in the world is to serve a cause. And to serve it with all your heart and soul and might, as the Bible says, you know, and if it really is, if it really is good for you, then it will make you feel like I'm growing. Like I, I have done things in my life, you have too, where I was exhausted at the end of the day. I was exhausted at the end of the year. I was exhausted at the end of the decade. Mm -hmm. but I really felt that I was involved in something important and valuable and good. And I grew in the process of my involvement. That's a healthy involvement, okay? That's a healthy relationship, you know? Um, that's, the, that's the subtlety of it. Uh, and, and I think also, you know, sometimes people will make assumptions about me that this is the only issue that I care about. Uh, yeah. It happens to be something that I have a lot of years of experience with. I yeah. thank my dad for spurring this on. Uh, thank you. Uh, He's a but, great man, your dad. But... He was a great man, your dad. Mm, thank you. Thank you. He was pretty cool. I remember him very fond. Mm. And yeah, and he loved you very much. Force of uh, nature. <laughs> yeah, it's a force of nature, right? Yeah. Wanting to make a difference, wanting to take on causes, seeing a need and filling it. And uh, and so the the reason that I care about this isn't that I just care about this. I mean, I care about a lot of other issues and try to do what I can for other issues. But I guess I want people to have the freedom. I want people to have the freedom to choose so they can get involved in the issues and they can get involved in their life and they can feel like that they know kind of who they are. So no one else gets to define that for them. And that feels fundamental to me so that then people can go out in the world and take on causes and take on a life or even just be okay with having joy. Because in so many of these um, kind of cultic relationships or political movements, it's so serious and life is so serious. And then there's, there isn't room for joy. And I, I think about also when you were talking about just listening and that people feel that, you know, you offered them some sage advice and I'm sure you did, but I, I will often be told, thank you so much for your advice about such and such. And I swear, I never said that, <laughs> but it's that, they heard me say, you know, yeah, go for it. Or I think you're right because I didn't argue or because I just listened, but really they were listening to themselves. And right. And, and I think that's why that inner voice is so demonized by so many people trying to control it because they know how acute it can be, how on point it can be and why they need to tell you, oh no, that's Satan or that's you miss you're being misguided or you can't trust that inner voice because they, I think people trying to control you know how powerful it is. Yes. Look, I, I use the word soul because that's the, the religious language that I'm trained in. A psychologist might use the word self or might use the word personality. But I really do believe that there's a part of us, which is the soul, the, 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 the essence, the center of our authenticity. And I believe that in, in some ways it's, it, you know, Freud called it an unconscious it's somewhat separated from our conscious self so that it watches us and it protects us. And when it sees that we're in danger, it cries out and it forces us to try a different way. And, and that's, as you said, that's what that controlling leader or mm -hmm. that controlling relationship is most afraid of. Mm -hmm. um, in religious texts, you have a great deal of meditation about this question of when do you listen to the voice of the self and when do you listen to the voice of God? Mm -hmm. You know. You have the story of the binding of Isaac, you know, where, where Abraham is told to suppress his conscience and suppress his fatherly love and go sacrifice his kid, you know. And there's a tremendous literature in my faith and in other faiths that says that when Abraham hears the angel's voice at the end of the story telling him, don't touch the kid, that's the voice of his self. That the self is reasserting itself against God, saying, no, you can't steal this from me. This is who and what I am takes tremendous courage to do that. Now, when the soul screams out, sometimes what it needs is, as you said, it's just a quiet, safe space. 
They didn't need me or you to tell them what to do. The soul was telling them what to do. But they needed us to provide that quiet, safe space in which the soul can flower and, and speak loudly. And they heard it. And that you're right. That's exactly what they heard. That's exactly what they heard. So you, you were talking also about um, the need to belong and also common languages and being able to speak a common language. One of the things that I find most helpful when people are part of a community is incorporating other communities and having, like we have services for a whole variety of different communities and I'd love you to be able to talk about that. But I think it is to be able to show that we have this common language. Uh, and so we, it might be in a different language, but it's the same message. Yeah. So I am familiar with some of the services that are provided, but can you sort of go through the year? And let me know, because I know there's one for the Armenian genocide that I remember was, you know, always so, so powerful. Uh, and what else? Yeah, well, well, here's the thing. Um, our communities uh, exist side by side. Uh, many communities exist side by side. And the ability to connect them is quite remarkable. And there's this tremendous energy that comes about when we connect with them. So I, I think that's very, very important. Uh, give me just a, an example of something off the, off the religious path. Um, I'm a cancer patient. 20 years ago, I had a very, very vicious cancer. And I'm incredibly blessed and incredibly lucky to have gotten past that and to have survived. Um, so I speak to cancer survivor groups all the time. It's one of my commitments is, you know, as a, as a reward, for, as a, as a, as a giving back a, a, a recompense for, for having um, survived this, I, I, I'll accept almost any invitation from a cancer community to come and speak to cancer patients and survivors. I speak cancer because uh, I can say things to these people that nobody else can say. Um, I'll give you just one, one interesting insight because something you said a moment ago raised this with me. Can you laugh? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I find life very funny. I mean, and, and it even, I know this is going to sound really irreverent, but, but even in very serious, I give funny funerals. I mean, <laughs> I, I find, because it's human and human, you know, there's got to be joy and there's got to be humor and there's got to be laughter. One of the signs of a controlling community or a controlling relationship is that you've lost laughter and you've lost the humor of it. And you're, you're, in a, you're unable to poke fun at it. And irreverence is punished instead of embraced. A healthy community embraces irreverence because a healthy community is secure enough to say, go ahead, make fun. And we're secure in what we believe in and secure in our connections with each other. You can make all the fun of us you want. Mm -hmm. You know that there's a Jewish holiday called Purim once a year where we goof around with everything in the synagogue and carnival in the Catholic tradition, Mardi Gras, in New Orleans. These are these are the, you know the, these wonderful, humorous, irreverent moments. Um, when I'm with cancer patients, we laugh a lot. It, it, this sounds strange to people who are not in our circle, but the fact that you're sitting at the edge on the abyss of, immort of mortality can be some of the funniest things in the world. You know, I tell people that I had to take a medicine for two years called Five Fu. Uh, swear to God, that's the name of the medicine. And, and that's exactly right. And everyone in the room cracks up because most of us take, take the, it's a very common cancer medicine. But uh, there's a reason why it's called 5-FU. And, and we can laugh. That's what we share. And the laughter means we connected with each other. Um, yeah. so, so what we try to do is to find a language that connects with each other. Your pain is your pain and my pain is my pain. And we each live with it, but if I could reach out and let you know that I hear you and care for you, a smile comes across your face because that's what all of us want. Know that I hurt and know where I I celebrate. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what religion is supposed to be. That's what communion is supposed to be. Right, and and it's beautiful. And yes, and so many people d do say, you know, my life was humorless coming up to this point, and yeah. I realize how how wonderful it is to be able to joke, how wonderful it is to be around people who are healthy enough to kind of get the joke. Uh, they've done a recent study about couples that stay together longer and are healthier. And those are the ones that can kind of be a little, kind of make fun of each other, but in a safe way, because yeah. it's okay to do that. And you know each other's stick, so to speak. And you can, right. you know, I mean, I, I still remember speaking about my dad, <laughs> he used to, he used to, um, in public places, 
he would say loud enough for everyone to hear, you know what, Rachel, I don't care how anyone else feels about you. I think you're nice. <laughs> <laughs> and it would be like at the checkout stand, you know, <laughs> and I thought it was hilarious because right. there was that safety in that relationship. And then he'd wink, you know, <laughs> but it would get everyone to sort of stare and then they'd see that it was a joke. But there was the, there was the ability to do that because there was the knowing, you know, of the relationship and of the common respect and humor. And he was very funny. Right. Right. Exactly. But the, the evidence of a humorless relationship tells you something's wrong. Mm -hmm. That's not right. the way it's supposed to be. Joy, humor, laughter, mm -hmm. warmth, connect, are part of connection that's healthy. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I think I get, you know, sometimes when I go to services, I get goosebumps for different reasons. And I remember go, coming to a Friday night service where there was a Baptist choir or a singer yeah. who yeah. blew my socks off. I don't yes. know if I was wearing socks, but yes. you know what I mean? Beautiful. Uh, and it was just gorgeous because it was that speaking that same language of just praying to something or singing to something kind of ethereal and greater than or whatever that was. Right. That's the feeling. Mm -hmm. that's, that's common language. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, so to come back um, also to this story that I was hoping you would tell about how there are some people who impose their needs on other people, religious leaders and controllers, and they don't mind how much another person suffers to prove, to be self-sacrificial, to prove their allegiance. And I'm remembering a story, uh, if you can tell it, about a, a woman who needed to go down to the well and bring buckets back to a dinner. Yeah, the, the story is of a great Lithuanian rabbi of the 19th century named Israel Salanter. Salanter was the uh, the head of a great religious institution, a yeshiva. And the, the story, there, there's a custom in Jewish faith that before we eat a meal, we wash our hands. And uh, the idea is to pour a cup full of water three times over each hand and then say a blessing and wash, wipe your hands. That's a religious custom. So the, the meal a meal was held, uh, the rabbi had been invited to a very uh, wealthy man's house and uh, the rabbi, instead of pouring cups of water over his hands, just gingerly dipped his fingertips into the water. And when the host saw him do this, he said, Rabbi, don't you want to fully wash your hands? And the rabbi looked at the man and said, you see that maid in the corner? It's her job to go down to the river and carry buckets of water up to, the, up to your home, up here on the hill. My sanctity, my piety, cannot be earned on her shoulders. Now that's an ethic, an ethic of piety that recognizes that, that before you can worship God, you have to care for the people who are about you. And the people who are about you are not divided by social class or economic power. Every human being carries God with them. And the God we worship has to be, the, the first place to worship God is to care for the people in the circle about you. So in, in terms of the language that I offered a moment ago, in terms of that dialectic, mm -hmm. a religious leader's job is to make sure that you, Rachel, or whoever is in front of me is growing, is your soul is being nurtured, your soul is being fed, your soul is being celebrated, your soul can express its aspirations in the world. Um, that's my job. That, that's really what my role is. Anytime it's about me and not about you. Anytime it's about worshiping my soul instead of helping your soul grow, anytime I'm suppressing the soul of anyone, I am abusing my privilege and power and prerogative as a clergyman. I'm conducting evil. That's what evil is. The clinical definition of evil is when I separate myself from you and ask for your my aggrandizement at the cost of your suppression. Mm. That's just evil. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 a religious tradition has to teach two ethics. And again, it's a dialectic, which means two truths which are opposite, but they exist, exist exactly at the same time together. One is the duty to obey, and the other is the duty to disobey. Mm. One is the responsibility to follow, to serve, to revere, and the other is a duty to question, to be skeptical, to be critical. In my Jewish faith, yours, there, there is a tremendous respect for atheism, believe it or not, because the atheist has a place. 
The atheist is the one who has the courage to ask the question, is any of this real? And while we may answer that question different than the atheist might answer it, the fact that he or she has the courage to ask the question, you know, who died and made you king? Who put you up on that pulpit? Who put that outfit on you? Who gave you the prerogatives of leadership? Are you really serving the sole needs of the people in the community? That voice of irreverent criticism, that voice that questions authority, that voice of rebellion is embraced by my Jewish tradition, is embraced by the biblical tradition. Look, Abraham is told by God, I'm going to destroy the town of Sodom. And God said, and Abraham says, you can't do that because you're God. You have to do justice. I mean, the idea that a guy is going to tell God to back off, he can't do it, is because that voice of rebellious, irreverent criticism is embraced by a religious tradition. It exists at the exact same time as the voice which says, serve, revere, praise, worship. Both have to exist at the same time. If a religious community tells you to suppress the voice of your irreverence, to suppress the voice of criticism, to not ask a question, run. Because that is an oppressive community that will ultimately end up destroying souls. But if a community says, go ahead, ask me any question you want. Go ahead, tell me why I'm wrong. That's a community that, that, you, that you can belong to because it's a community that recognizes that you're a thinking, feeling, moral human soul. Right. In terms of helping people develop, when you squash their critical thinking and when you make them think that there's something wrong with them for questioning. Right. And the idea that rebellion is part of the tradition mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is critical. It takes some bravery to have rebellion. It's good to know that your community supports you in doing it. That's not true of a lot of communities. That's not yeah. true of a lot of Jewish communities. Um, but I know being raised on the tradition of, you know, Abraham Joshua Heschel and people who marched, people who tried to make a difference, people who were theologians and philosophers and activists and, 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 that it was more about how you behaved than what you believed. And for some people, I think it's because of what they believed that it's how they behaved, because they believed that the, the world could be a better place. Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering, in keeping with that theme, going to this idea of the the metal detectors and and that that to me felt like a devolution that felt to me like there were base instincts that are being fed uh again and that you know anti-semitism is on the rise i think there are a lot of people who are kind of um saying probably that it's it's more of an issue than it is even though it's a big issue and i and i don't want to downplay it, but there, there are people sort of on both sides who are capitalizing on it. And I want to have a clear message of if it affects you, if you know, or if you're, if it's bothering you, you want to be able to do something about it. But what do you think gets us to that point where we, we're not living in a world that is seeing the common language, where we're seeing how we are different? And then what do we, what do we do about that? I know that's a big question. Yeah. Um, it's a wonderful question. And look, your listeners have heard your story about coming through the metal detectors. So let me just respond to that briefly. I, I gave a sermon. Uh, I, in the Jewish faith, uh, our high holidays come in September. It's the Jewish New Year and then the Day of Atonement, Yom, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. It's a day when many, 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 many Jews, almost all the members of our communities and many friends and family come to synagogue. Um, if, if you're Christian, it's Christmas services or Easter services. It's the, the service everybody goes to, even if they don't go any other time of year. So the, the place is packed. I'm speaking in front of 1,800 people on Rosh Hashanah morning. And if you remember, the sermon started with an apology. I apologize to the community. I said, I'm sorry we had to do this to you. And I am acutely aware of how offensive this is. You can walk into the shopping mall, into a movie theater, into a restaurant, drugstore, bank. Nobody hassles you. Nobody looks you over. Nobody checks your pockets or your purse. But to come to worship God, you have to pass through a metal detector. My God, that breaks my heart, especially kids who have never experienced this before. It absolutely breaks my heart. But we live in a time and a place when hate is real. 
hate is real. And it's, of course, anti-Semitism is one facet of it. It's hatred. Uh, it's racial hatred. It's racial hatred against African-Americans, people of color. It's hatred against immigrants. It's hatred for the LGBTQ community. It's hateful for people who are different. Um, and, and unfortunately, this hate has expressed itself in vicious acts of violence. You know, uh, a gay nightclub is shot up by a guy. A, a synagogue is attacked with a gun. Um, a, a mosque, a, a brother, a Sikh brother wearing his beautiful turban on the street is attacked and, and, and beaten. A, a sister wearing her, 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 her headscarf in a restaurant is refused service. I mean, this is what we're living in now. You and I grew up in the 60s when we fought like hell for, for the civil rights of all peoples. And we thought, well, we'd raise our kids in a world where hate, prejudice, discrimination wouldn't exist. That was our dream. Mm -hmm. This is the exact opposite of that dream. And it's all over the place. And it has many sources. And we can sort of name all of the sources. The instrument of it, of course, is the Internet. Because... Angry people now can find other angry people right. and radicalize one another, and they share narratives about how Jews and Latinos and and gay, lesbian, trans people are coming to steal the culture and steal their values. Uh, um, you know, and, and the, so the, the internet is is a, is one piece of this. It's a way for for angry people to attach themselves to movements of anger. That's one piece of it. The second piece of it is the vicious political polarization. And here you can ask, is it cause or effect? You know, are the president's words, is the president, was the president elected by angry people or is he stoking the anger? And I think it's both is true. He is both a product of his culture and also he's a catalyst for it. Um, I think deep down personally, uh, I think deep down it has to do with a sense of the changes that are coming to our world and our culture. We are becoming way more diverse. In a few years, America will be a majority minority world population. White people will no longer be the majority. People of color will be the majority. Now, you and me, we delight in that. I think that's delicious. I love to hear languages on the street that are not English when I walk the, when I walk on the street. I love to see. I have a I, there's a Sikh family that lives around the block from us, and this guy and his wife walk. And she wears this gorgeous sari and he wears his, his turban and it's beautiful. And, and, and they're African-American families and Latino families and Asian families and gay families and lesbian families. I think it's gorgeous. There are people who are terrified of this. The hate is a response to their terror. They're terrified of the fact that their jobs are going to be threatened because artificial intelligence is going to begin replacing them. They're terrified of immigrants. They're terrified of difference. Difference terrifies people. So that's the source of it. What is the ultimate dynamic of hate? When I see change in the world and I'm made uncomfortable by it, I can ask one of two questions. I can either say, hey, what can I do about this? How can I cope with this? How can I, what do I need to learn in order to keep up with this? Or I can say, who did this to me? The first question, how can I keep up with this? What can I learn to become part of this? How can I, that's the healthy question. That's the, that's the healthy question that a healthy democracy asks. Question, who did this to me? Who did this to me? That's the question that leads to the hate. And unfortunately, in our politics, in our culture, in our media, that's the question that's being asked more often. That's why you have metal detectors in front of the scene. And that's why you have, um, you know, th th that's, why, th that's why you have all of the kinds of tensions we have around the fear of, you know, am I going to be safe? Am my kids going to be safe? Not just Jewish kids, but all kinds of kids. Right. Okay. So, you know, when people say, oh, I don't see color, I think, well, that's a shame because, you know, <laughs> there's just such beauty in seeing how people are bringing their own cultures or their own history to your world. And I also think that it's it's someone, I think, trying to sound, you know, like they really don't care. They're, what matters, I think, is after you notice what you think is different, how you react to it. Because I think there are a lot of kids who will stare at a person who looks different just because it's different. Our eye gravitates towards what's different. If there was a whole 
poster of stars, let's say, that were orange and there's one that was red, we would notice the red one. So that's what happens. So it depends then how you are taught to feel about that thing that's different. I think that is the pivotal piece. And probably what you try to do as part of the curriculum in the schools and youth groups at the synagogue to try to look at what's different in a way that isn't less than, mm. uh, that isn't fearful. And so how do you, how do you teach that? Especially if sometimes at home they're getting a different message. Well, that's a big problem. Look, it, it begins with a deep sense of personal security. If I know who I am and I'm comfortable in my own skin and I'm comfortable with my own culture and my own sense of belonging, my own community, and I'm delighted to welcome people who are different because I'm eager to know how we're the same and how we're different. And I'm able to see that there are similarities, our overlaps are so much greater than our differences, right? We 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 want the same things. We want a place to raise our children in safety and joy. We 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 all enjoy, you know, a cold beer on a hot day and a swim in the pool and a hug from a child and a chocolate chip ice cream and the things that we love. Um, that's the beginning. The, the fear comes when I'm not sure if I can cope with the world in front of me. Listen, and I understand this. I get it. I don't believe in it, but I get it. You know, what do you do when you're living in a kind of community and the hardware store turns into a yoga studio and the Baptist church changes into a Hindu temple and the McDonald's turns into a sushi bar and suddenly you feel like a stranger in your own world? Mm -hmm. So people, you can, again, you can respond. If you have a deep sense of security, you could say, this is great. <laughs> this is wonderful. Let's go and enjoy the sights and smells of a more interesting, diverse, and beautiful world. But if you're not feeling that way, you say, oh my God, they've taken away what's important to me, and I'm going to strike back. I, I, I don't want to get political because I don't think that's the nature of your podcast, but just as a note, it, it, it occurs to me interesting that the president's motto isn't make America great. It's make America great again. The again adds a note to it that, that, that concerns me, okay? It concerns me because it says, you know, once upon a time we were homogenous, we were different, and now I think we're losing that which we believed made us great, and we want to recover it. Well, that's the danger. To me, that's the dangerous process because I'd like to be great, and I think diversity makes us greater. I think welcoming the outsider and their ideas and cultures makes us greater. I think we're a greater country. The more greater we reflect the rainbow of humanity, uh, the more we include, you know, women's voices, the voices of LGBTQ people, the voices of other cultures and, and faiths. I mean, I think that we become a greater culture. It's the again part that scares me. I, I don't mean this to be political because that's yeah. not the purpose of the comment, but I, to me, that's the soul of the fear. Fear is what is at the heart of hate. Fear is what's the heart of the things that, that we're seeing. You know, and when you have a lonely person who's isolated and he converts his fear into rage and buys a gun and enters a synagogue or a mosque or a church or a, a gay club you know, in order to rage on those that are taking away that which they once believed was great, that's where we have, that's where we have trouble. And the world, it's going to get worse because we're going to get more diverse and change is happening more quickly. And this is what concerns me the most. Okay. So you see it getting worse before it hopefully gets better. You know, I don't, I, I'm not a prophet. I just, it, it, there are things changing around us. It is more of a global world. Artificial intelligence is going to begin to replace jobs at a much faster rate than we're used to. Climate change is coming. Climate change is going to change the dynamics of economics and population movements around the world. Things are happening which are going to upset. You and I grew up in a bubble, and we have to realize this. A, a moment in history that was not ideal, but close to it, mm -hmm. certainly close to it. Um, I'm not sure that our kids are going to enjoy the same level of stability. I, I agree. And I, I know for my kids, it is, it's terrifying thinking about global warming. It's terrifying knowing that there are these forces 
uh, that are going to outpace potentially what people can do to stem the tide, um, literally at times. And so I think all the more reason for there to be a connection, because if there are things happening around you that make you feel, I think, small or that make you feel powerless. You want to be able to feel like you have a community. I mean, it should, it should be something that would be wonderful. And I think also going back to something you were saying about how if something turns into like what you know to something of sushi place or whatever, which is I'm always you know up for. Uh, but I I think what you're talking about it's like a mathematical equation. If you see it, that it's it's a mathematical equation that's addition, or if you see it as subtraction, right? Does this add to my world? Does this add to my awareness of other people? Does this add to the potential for me to learn how to connect, to, to push myself out of my whatever it is, you know, whatever that bubble is, the comfort zone, and, and see how I am with other people and grow in that way? That's an addition, but not look what they're taking away from us and look what's missing. Right. The religious reflection of this is, again, a dialectic, two truths which are opposite, but both true. Okay. On the one hand, religious community has to offer a sense of security, and by, because, it, because as, a, as a community, it has to have a boundary, right? Jewish people say, we are the chosen people. The Catholic Church, members of the church say, our church. Um, other groups, religious groups, have a sense of our circle. That's a wonderful thing because it makes me sound I belong here. These are my people. These are the people I share with. But at the very same time, religion has to force us outside of that circle to meet the rest of humanity and recognize their dignity their, and res- learn how to respect them and to see that we are one human family. Right? Give you an example of this. In Genesis 12, Abraham, the first Jew in our faith, is chosen. God says, leave home, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. And then God says something interesting to us. So that's the greatest expression of our community and our specialness, our particularity. But then God says, hey, Abraha, in Hebrew, be a blessing. And in case you miss it, at the end of the passage, he says, adama. all the families of the earth will be blessed by you. So is this a statement of Abraham's closed circle community chosenness yes but it's also a circle that says and your responsibility is to go into the world and to be a blessing and a source of blessing for all peoples a religious community that doesn't let you out of the circle that tells you to be suspicious of people outside the circle that tells you that people outside the circle are evil that they're broken that they're poisonous that's dangerous because a religious circle says Yes, we're special, we're important, we're great, but go out and meet all the other families on the block. Go out and meet everybody else. Don't convert them. Hug them. Enjoy their cultures. Enjoy their diversity. We are secure enough in our own faith and convictions to know that the people next door have their opportunity to worship God in their way. That that dialectic of particularity and universalism our circle and the circle of humanity has to be at the heart of contemporary religion because not only are we a global world economically we're now we have to be a global world culturally we have to think about ourselves as all god's children it's too small a planet to hide from the rest of humanity it's a very small planet and there's a lot of us and we have to learn how to work together and get along and climate change is going to make it worse And the advance of technology is going to make it harder. But we have to learn this lesson or else we're going to go into extinction. That really is my conviction. So that dialectic has to be at the heart of healthy religion. Okay. It's so powerful. Well, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So you're welcome. I guess finishing up, I mean, I, I, I know you have thousands of stories to share, but I'm wondering if there is a story you can share about connection about even from children who are part of the community in ways that they've made connections, a way that can make you feel hopeful about, you know, the future. I'm, I'm really um, heartened when I meet with kids. And, and I'm heartened because kids, the kids that I meet with, the kids in my neighborhood, the kids in my 
synagogue community, the kids that I speak to on campuses across this area, they're, they're beyond us in so many ways. Um, they're, you know, they, they don't worry, they, they don't see, they don't see and they're not prejudiced against some of the differences that people of our generation were hung up about. You know, you're gay, you're lesbian, you're trans, okay. They, they, they're very accepting of one another in that way. Um, they're very, they, they, they're not interested in, they're not interested and not committed um, by and large uh, to, to defining themselves uh, by their economic achievements, their material possessions. They're really searching for a sense of mission, searching for a cause. They really want to feel, um, they really want to feel like they're fighting for something great. I don't know if you, you saw, but yesterday Time Magazine named this young woman, Greta Thunberg, as their person of the year. That to me is emblematic of the kids that I know, because I know hundreds and hundreds of Gretas. I know hundreds of kids who are fighting climate change. I know hundreds of kids who are fighting prejudice. I know lots and lots of kids that are fighting homelessness. They want to feel a sense of mission. You and I belong to a generation. Because largely of the degradation of society, because of the war that was being fought and lots of other reasons, our generation had a sense of activism. We went to the streets. We fought for all of it. We fought for civil rights for African Americans. We fought for, we fought for women's rights for feminism. We fought against a war that was immoral. We questioned the authority of our government. And then that went into quiescence for a couple of generations. I, I feel it coming back. I, I feel these kids want to save their world. That they are natives to the world of technology. So global, they think globally. They think past so many of the things that, that our generation feels divides us, and they want to make a difference. So I'm very heartened by these kids, right. and, and they give me a great, deal, a great deal of satisfaction when I get to spend time with them. And what I can give them is I can give them the perspective of generations. I can show them where I know the dead ends are. I can show them, I can show them where the you know, life dead ends are and talk to them about what it means to really find success and happiness. Mm -hmm. in the world. And I can also offer them ancient faiths, at least my own faith, which in, in many ways understood from the very beginning. I mean, the very first words of the Hebrew Bible, you know, talk about a world, a God who creates a world and puts human beings in that world. And those human beings propagate the rest of us. We are one family, one family sharing one world. And if we don't learn how to live like a family sharing a world, we're going to lose it. And these kids really have a deep instinctual understanding of that. So I'm heartened. I may be the only optimist you've ever met who wears a rabbi yarmulke, but I am, I'm actually a sort of optimist because as, as difficult as the condition of the world is, I'm, I'm heartened by the idealism of the children, of the young people. It's reminding me, you know, when, uh, about two things, actually. I remember my childhood was filled with making a lot of signs. Yeah, right. Exactly right. <laughs> right. And t-shirts, 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 <laughs> t-shirts. Getting the poster board and the thing to put it on and whatever, and whatever, McGovern, whatever it was, you know, anti this, pro that. And I remember leaving with my mom in the station wagon and having my dad yell out, "Have a good time! Don't get arrested!" And uh, <laughs> you know, it was just that's what you did. You may, or the refuse next, right? And, and um, doing what you could for people all over the world. Um, there is a story. There's a story that comes to mind, and I guess maybe you'd want to finish with this. It's actually a beautiful story. The story is a rabbi, a great teacher of religious wisdom, is sitting with a group of his disciples, and he asks them this question. How do you know when night is over and day begins? And the students thought they understood the import of the question because there are certain rituals you can only do at daybreak. You're not allowed to do at night. So the students started answering him in a, in a deeply pious way. One of the oldest students said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, he said, I know when night is over and day begins, when I can see the line that separates my field from the field of my neighbor. And the other student says, no, Rabbi. I know when night is over and day begins when I see an animal in the distance and I can tell if that's my horse or the horse of my neighbor. And the other third student says, no, Rabbi, I can tell the difference night is over and day begins when I can see a house in the distance and I know that it's my house and not the house of my neighbor. And the Rebbe begins to weep. 
and he weeps. And the students don't understand why is the rabbi crying? And he says, my students, my boys, is this what you think religion is for? To divide us? That religion is about drawing disjunctions and divisions and separations, isolations. Is this really what I've taught you religion is? He says, no. Night is over when day be and day begins when you look to the person sitting next to you, when you look in their eyes and you can see that that's your brother. You can see that's your sister. When you see that person is your brother and your sister, the long, long night is over and the new day begins. And I leave you that as a global lesson, okay? I love it, I love it. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's reminding me of a sign I saw with, I feel like is my motto and maybe I'm Pollyannish, but it said, uh, the beginning is near. Yeah, on that. <laughs> uh, and it was, it's exactly, you know, what you're talking about, about the, the promise of connection, of seeing the other and really seeing them. Right. Exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your, for your wisdom, for your humor, for your friendship, <laughs> for your guidance. And, uh, keep on keeping on as we as we say and i will um hopefully talk to you again soon one more thing before you go i'm very happy that eddie and i had a chance to speak about some important and some difficult issues together one of the issues we broached was the idea of fear of the other turning into anger and hatred of the other. Fear turning into anger is something that is commonly seen even within family systems. When we're worried about our loved ones who we think made us feel worried for no good reason and after finding out that they're okay, but we were suffering not knowing if they were okay, we can get angry. A lot of parents will share with me that the first time their kids go out on their own or go driving alone for the first time. The first few minutes that they come back later than they said, well, we're okay. We let them have a little bit of a pass because we know sometimes you know things happen and people come back late. But the next 15 minutes turn into a time of worry. If you can't reach them by phone, should you start calling their friends? Mm, should you think about maybe calling a hospital? And then the next 15 minutes, you can start to get angry. Angry that they have made you worried. Angry that someone you love so much might be someone who is not taking your emotions seriously. So a lot of parents talk about how finally when their loved one walked in perfectly fine, but an hour late, the first time when their parents were worried about them, they are furious at them and yelling at them because their loved one made them feel abject fear about what seemed like carelessness and that fear turned into anger. It's a natural human emotion. And even though it's a natural human emotion, that emotion can be stoked by people wanting to create dissension and wanting there to be an unfounded fear or hatred or unreasonable fear or hatred based on no action of the other at all, based on them just being them or being different or being other. Emotions can also cause other emotions with one emotion connecting and leading to the other. For example, if you fear someone, you might get enraged with them because they've caused you to feel threatened. Language can also contribute to the emotions we feel and Language is sometimes purposely given derogatory kind of fear-mongering usage. And the words were given to characterize certain people or certain situations were purposely given to us to cause a certain emotion. And fear is an adaptive behavior that we've built into our systems to help identify threats and to survive. So, if people can be seen as those who are threatening our very survival somehow, then we can fear them or hate them in ways that have nothing to do with them. And physiology can also have causal impacts. Fear and anger register in similar ways in the body, just in terms of how our hearts race. 
how we can have shallow breathing, how we break into a sweat and have a tightening in our stomachs or sometimes respond with that fight or flight survival mechanism and a release of adrenaline. According to a recent study, there are over 1,000 organized hate groups in the United States alone. The study is based on data collected by the Southern Poverty Law Center and presented at their annual census of hate groups. It's a terrible census to have to have. And they looked at the presence of hate groups on Twitter and Southern Poverty Law Center found that the number of likes and comments, positive comments, on hate group accounts grew by 900% in the last three years alone. So what do we do? The antidote to hate is often talked about as compassion for others as well as for ourselves. Self-compassion means that we accept our whole self. If we find parts of ourselves unacceptable, we tend to attack others in order to defend against that internal threat. But hate fills a void, which also makes it hard to combat. Not impossible to combat, but certainly does make it harder to fight. Psychologist Bernard Golden, author of Overcoming Destructive Anger, believes that when hate involves participation in a group, in a hate group, it may help foster a sense of connection and camaraderie that fills a void in one's identity. He described hatred of individuals or groups as a way of distracting oneself from the more challenging and anxiety-provoking task of creating one's own identity. Acts of hate are attempts to distract oneself from feelings of helplessness, powerlessness, injustice, inadequacy, and shame. And hate is grounded in some sense of perceived threat, as we discussed. It's an attitude that can give rise to hostility and aggression towards individuals or groups. Like anger, it is sort of a distraction from inner pain a lot of the time. The individual consumed by hate may believe that the only way to regain some sense of power over his or her own pain is to preemptively strike out at others. And in this context, each moment of hate is a temporary reprieve from inner suffering. The answer to why we hate, according to Silvia Ducevici, a social worker, president and founder of the Critical Therapy Center, lies not only in our psychological makeup or family history, but also in our cultural and political history. We live in a war culture that promotes violence in which competition is a way of life, she says. And we fear connecting because it requires us to reveal something about ourselves. We're taught to hate the enemy, meaning anyone different than us, which leaves little room for vulnerability and an exploration of hate through empathic discourse and understanding. And in our current society, one is more ready to fight than to resolve conflict. Peace is seldom the option. But hatred has to be learned, Golden says. We are all born with the capacity for aggression as well as the capacity for compassion. Upon doing some of my own research, I found out something surprising and actually a bit hopeful. Humans are born with two fears. This is based upon a vast amount of study that's been done not just by me, but information that has been culled from many scientists. Just two fears, a fear of falling and a fear of loud noises. And all other fears are learned. That's vital to remember. All other fears are learned. So when you're in a position to educate those who are young or those who are older, but have become so exaggerated in their fear response and in their blind hatred, remember that what is learned can also be unlearned. It doesn't mean it's easy, but it means it's possible. And to end in keeping with the theme of humor that Eddie and I talked about, I'll quote the comedian Dennis Leary, who once said, racism isn't born, folks, it's taught. 
I have a two-year-old son. Know what he hates? Naps. End of list. Well said. Talk to you next week. I'm excited to say that this podcast is now available on additional platforms. If you want to listen to Indoctrination, it's available for download on the NPR Radio Public app, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and more. Please support Indoctrination at patreon.com slash indoctrination. We now have a big library of content that you can access with any donation. And subscribers receive bonus interviews and other cool goodies. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. Thank you for your support.